Hello, and welcome to the Inside Writing Podcast. I am your host, Josh Sippy. As a reminder, all of these episodes are recorded live Wednesdays, 1 to 2 p.m. Eastern time. You can sign up on the Gotham Writers website for free. Now then, on to the show. Today, we're talking with Phil Cohen. Phil is a developmental editor and literary executive for Warner Brothers. Throughout his time there and, his previ- and in his previous role at Sony Pictures, Phil has acquired dozens of books, comics, graphic novels, and long-form articles to develop into feature films and television series. Hello, Phil. Welcome back to the show. Hello. How's it going? Good, good. Thanks for being here today. So, someone in the comments, by the way, was asking what that song is, and it's called uh, "I Don't Live Here Anymore" by the War on Drugs, and I'm obsessed with it. I can't stop listening to it. It's great. <laughs> we only got two minutes of it, which is a shame, but that's okay. You can listen to it now. Uh, so, Phil, you you play a big part in bringing stories to the big screen, and we'll get into that. But I want to start with how you got to where you are. Uh, so, what was sort of that creative spark that kicked off your journey to your current position? Sure. I mean, when I was a kid, I was like obsessed with movies to the point where I would like just go around Blockbuster and like look at the run times of all the VHSs. And that was like a super exciting Friday night activity for me. My dad's like, do you want to like rent a movie? And I'm like, yeah, I'll rent a movie, but I'm more excited to go around and look at the run times. Uh, And I would like watch the credits and I was what is a key grip and all these kind of like mysterious things when you're six years old, and you don't have the internet at your disposal to figure out what it is. Um, but I always knew I was going to work in movies. I just don't really feel like I was ever qualified to do anything else. So then it was just a matter of how I was going to. Um, and after college, you know, in college, I interned at like various entertainment related things. I'm also interested in music. So I inter- uh, interned at Columbia Records, a record label and various other entertainment adjacent things. Um, But after college, I was like, oh, maybe the way that I want to work in entertainment is as an entertainment lawyer. So I went to law school um, thinking I was going to be an entertainment lawyer. And then I got there. I was like, this kind of sucks. And I don't think I'd be very good at it. And I don't think I'd enjoy it very much. So I actually I graduated. I passed the bar. So I'm an attorney if I want to be. And then I practiced law for exactly zero days of my entire life uh, and did what I imagine is probably pretty unpopular career path, which is I graduated law school and then went to go be an assistant in a talent agency for $30,000 a year. Um, So I was an assistant at CAA in New York, which is one of like the big two to three talent agencies basically in the country for film and TV stuff. And, you know, they work with sports and comedy and everything basically. So what I did in New York, so let me back up a little bit. So when I was uh, interning during law school at William Morris, which is the other big talent agency, um, I was like a, a legal assistant for all, or a legal intern for all intents and purposes. And most of what the New York office of WME did happened to be publishing. Um, so I didn't know anything about publishing before that internship. I was like, okay, I guess I'm going to learn about publishing. So I did that. And then when I went for an interview at CAA, they're like, well, we have an opening and it's in publishing. Do you have any experience in publishing? And I was like, As a matter of fact, I accidentally do. So they stuck me with uh, a new agent. Her name was Kate Hoyt. She'd recently gotten promoted from an assistant to an agent. I was her first assistant. Um, And what our department did was we kind of were like a servicing department for the entire agency. So if any CAA clients wrote a book, usually like a collection of essays or an autobiography or memoir or whatever, they sort of had an in-house literary agent who would shop their book around to publishers. So that's what I did. Um, and I kind of realized pretty quickly that I didn't want to be an agent. I just feel I felt like I didn't really have the personality for it. And I felt like a lot of her days were spent like pitching uh, like projects that she wasn't even particularly passionate about to people like 90 times in a row. And I was like, I do not have the ability to bullshit where like you're going to be able to not tell that I don't care about this. So I was like, I'm not going to be an agent. It's not on the cards. So I spoke to her and I was like, Hey, I'm thinking of, you know, trying to get, that's also what people do with these kind of uh, agency jobs. They sort of use their connections and what they sort of learn about while they're there. And they usually hop to something else that they're more interested in. Um, But she was like uh, an editor who we had submitted a lot of books to had just gotten this job at like as the, the head of book to film at Sony Uh, And she's like, you want to just go work there? And I was like, I didn't realize you could work for a movie studio from New York City. And she's like, you can. It's, you know, it's a book scout and you kind of look for books for the L.A. people who don't really know anything about publishing. Um, And then I was there for three years and then I've been here for four plus years at this point. But, yeah, that was I I was always going to work in film and TV. And I just came to it from like this very sort of weird side door that I didn't even know was a job until I started doing it, which is, I think, how everyone who does this feels. So what were you like the, throughout this journey? Was the goal always to just work in film generally, or did you just did you want to adapt films, or what was sort of like the overlying objective for you? 
you know, I've always been more of like a behind the scenes guy. So it's not like I wanted to be a director or I wanted to be an actor, God forbid, or I wanted to be like a writer. I, I just kind of like, I used to, you know, I took creative writing in college and I was like, oh my God, I, this is way too derivative of everything else that I like. And I don't, I like, I can't possibly look myself in the mirror. So I'm just not going to be a creative person when it comes to this particular thing. But I've always had like a pretty good sense of like, this sounds kind of odd and ephemeral, but like career trajectories. And what I mean by that is like this director makes this movie and then they make this movie and then they're right for this. Or like this actor, you pluck them from this place and then they're ready for this kind of project. Um, and that's always fascinated me, even in terms of like music and stuff, like the sort of idea of like the three album kind of like, oh, this band breaks out with their first album, so then they make this kind of album as their second album. Is it like the kind of, you know, the bigger, better, more expensive version of the first album, or is it the kind of stripped down left turn and then they return to form on the third album? So I always have these kind of trajectories in my head and it's kind of the way I consume the world and creative people. Um, so this, this job might feel like a bit of an odd fit for that kind of thing, uh, but it's like pairing material with creative people Mm. albeit in this kind of it already exists way which is kind of odd it's like i'm taking something that could be a insert director here project and saying could this be their project okay yeah it's this kind of story because it, it, it's different i don't know it, it feels different than like a script that they've already written or something like that because that's theirs or uh, it, it's just like could they adapt it to be more like something they're into as opposed to like this is what the script is is it right for them mm -hmm. So this seems like a good time to just ask, you know, your, your title, developmental editor and literary executive at Warner Brothers, and you've given us a good sense of what that means, but in your, what, what does that exactly mean? What does your job entail? Sure. So it's actually two different things that are mostly unrelated from each other. So I, for Warner Brothers, I'm a literary executive, which is, I'm basically being submitted projects and determining whether they're something that I want to pursue or something that I'm interested in or something that would be right for, let's say, one of our first look deals or one of the filmmakers we have relationships with. The developmental editor thing has actually nothing to do with Warner Brothers, and that was in response to me feeling like so much of my job there was like picking a project, being really excited about it, bringing it to like another exec who was based in LA, who was going to sort of act as like point on the project, and then kind of by no fault of their own or any sort of like you know them freezing me out, just by nature of what the the job is, like they're sort of the ones who take it from there. Like they hire writers, you know, I'm in the calls with the writer sometimes, or I'm kind of like brainstorming who the writers could be, but like. I'm not the one who's sort of making the creative decisions. And then that it was sort of born out of this thing of like, hey, I really like collaborating with writers and creative people. And, you know, sometimes I read a book and I'm like, oh, I could make this better for sure. <laughs> so then it was like, hey, I want to work directly with writers. So I actually work with writers and novelists to sort of take usually their first draft that they've like poured everything into and they kind of hit a wall where they're like, I don't know what the hell else to do. I feel like it's as good as it could be. I read it and then I sort of, you know, over the course of two to three calls or whatever like that, we kind of just like work on it, workshop it. And it's it's like big picture stuff because I'm thinking about it in a very cinematic way. Like I'm bringing the sort of movie and TV stuff to fiction and prose, which I think is kind of a weird approach sometimes. But I think sometimes thinking about a book in like a very sort of reductionist, simplistic three act structure, the way you would think about a movie is like very, very helpful because books are like weird. Structurally, they're very lumpy and there's like, detours and scenes that go nowhere and like it's hard to make things happen in a book sometimes you're like how do like what is what's actually supposed to happen in a book so i think thinking about it and thinking about the character and thinking about the plot and thinking about the tone and the themes in a very sort of cinematic kind of like dummy proof way even if the book is like very high-minded and literary and intelligent that can only ever strengthen the book and it never ever in my experience makes it worse so i love working with editor or i love working with authors in that capacity um but yeah, and it's it's two very completely different jobs because one of them is like sort of gathering information and intel and knowing what's going around to publishers and from literary agents and kind of reporting on the ground from New York to LA being like, okay, this is the stuff that the editors are talking about this week. This is the stuff that the editors are talking about this week, which is cool, but working one-on-one -on -one with authors is obviously a completely different job that has almost nothing to do with the other one, you know? Gotcha. So as far as, you know, when you find a story to be, a, or that you feel like should be adapted, what role do you, because it sounds like it's almost a hands-off role where you like, you pin a project and say, this one should be adapted. What What is your role in, in helping that project get to the big screen? Because that's a long process, obviously. It's super long and like 99% of the time it never actually happens. So I have like, you know, optioned a whole bunch of stuff in my lifetime and like the first things that I've optioned in like 2014 or 2015 are like finally starting to like actually start to get made now. I mean, one of them... I don't even know if I'm supposed to say this, but I'm just going to say it anyway. There's a book that I optioned 
that's coming out in March, April, something like that. Um, that was like, I optioned at the beginning of the pandemic and it was like, they were able to attach like a humongous, gigantic writer director, uh, pretty much basically the hottest one that you could possibly find at this particular point in time who agreed to write and direct it. He just turned in a script. He's meeting with actors right now. So like, I think because he is him, the studio is like, all right, so I guess we're making this movie. He said he wants to make it his next movie. So he's like meeting with actors, full systems go. Like, I think it, you know, we'll see what actually happens if that one happens. I feel like I kind of buy myself a couple of years of being like, Phew. all right. Um, <laughs> Sorry, I forgot the question. I just started. No, I was just it. asking what role you play in the in, in getting these. Oh yeah, these so that's from... one where because that one was like a hundred percent generated for me being like, this book is rad. This is like exactly up my alley, and then I happened to find like an exec who was sort of simpatico in terms of like what he was looking for, you know, what he responded to. So that's one where I'm super involved in because you know I brought it in and I was the one full throatedly advocating for it. There's other ones where I'm like more sort of keeping the studio abreast of the developments where like they'd read it. Maybe I wasn't crazy about it. Maybe someone over there was interested in it. I've, you know, I've sort of shepherded it along. Maybe I talked to the agent. Maybe I got like the lay of the land in terms of the other entities that were offering on it. So that's one where, because I'm so not super invested in it, or I just have very little ownership over the fact that we have it in the first place, I'm not going to sort of demand to, or be invited to like be sort of super collaborative on the creative elements of the project. Uh, so it really depends on the project. And honestly, it also depends on the exec who's, project it is because there's some people in LA who are like very protective and they're like I don't want these New York schmucks involved in my you know what and some people are like yeah you brought it in you have great thoughts you clearly liked it in the first place I like your brain let's talk about it what does that process look like so first off you mentioned you hear pitches from people is that how it, like agents pitch you books or do you happen to come across the book and you're like this is a good one or how does that yeah it's work? a lot more of the latter i personally unless absolutely necessary don't actually even really like to get books from agents because then i have to get back to them uh i know that sounds kind of like shitty but it's if i'm getting submitted books left and right from agents who are like you're gonna love this like i probably barely have time to even look at them let alone read the entirety of them let alone like then get back to the agent and be like yeah, it wasn't for me because 99.9% .9 of stuff is not for me or shouldn't be. You know, I think there's some people who do this job where they're like, yeah, totally. Like I'm trying to be amenable and excited about everything. But it's like, I think I'm valuable if I'm valuable because I say no so much. Mm -hmm. um, so all that to say, most of what my job is and most of what sort of scouting is, is like kind of keeping your ear to the ground and like being friends with editors and being friends with literary agents and other scouts and just sort of hearing what kind of stuff is selling. And then everyone just kind of sends each other everything. I know that sounds odd. It's like, oh, if you have proprietary, exciting, hot product, why would you kind of just send it willy nilly? And the idea is like, look, if I get like a super slip of like a really exciting early thing, clearly that's not the one I'm gonna send, but for some like project set in like 1600s rural China about like a pirate or something, I don't know. Uh, like I'll send that. Cause like there's a really, really, really good chance that I'm probably not gonna read that or that it's not a major studio movie, you know? Um, so a lot of it is like sort of quietly under the radar reading, evaluating whether I like something. Usually the answer is no. And then just moving on to the next thing. But you know, the, the shape of every day is different because I work with so many di different divisions. So I work with Warner Brothers, who's like the big, big, big studio movies. I work with New Line, who ostensibly makes like smaller budget or stuff like a lot of horror, used to be comedy when that was a theatrical genre that existed. Um, so they have smaller budgets. They're also a little scrappier. Um, but it's also the TV studio, Warner Brothers TV. So they have like a lot, a lot, a lot of first look deals with writer producers. So it's a lot of, a lot, a little more than I would like, like talking to just like various producers. And they say, I'd like a, I'd like a thriller. And I'm like, cool. If a thriller comes down my way, I'll give you a call. Um, and HBO Max, which is our streaming service. And those people are lovely and really nice and fun to work with. And they're good readers. Um, so I kind of have like every except for HBO proper, I have every facet of Warner Media sort of to put something if I like it that much, you know? Mm -hmm. I'm curious, are, are you like, how many of you are there that are out there scouting for this kind of stuff? You mean at other companies? At your company in general, and at just my, how many like- So at my seems... company, there's one other me, there's another guy, uh, that's it. And that's probably an unusual structure for a company this big, for the fact that we're scouting across all of Warner Media, uh, and film and TV, the fact that it's literally just us with like, we don't have assistants, we don't have, you know, we have readers, we have like the story department because it's like a big studio. So they have like a story department who does coverage and stuff. I kind of want it that way. I don't want like a, I want like a very sort of streamlined operation because I think as soon as you start getting like 
more people in, then everyone kind of feels like they have to like advocate for certain amounts of stuff per year to kind of like earn their keep. And also then you have like assistants and interns being like, what should I do today? And I'm like, just leave me alone. I got to read a book. <laughs> uh, but I, I like at a comparable company, like Netflix, for example, you know, my buddy just got a job over there. They are kind of rethinking how they do this. So they have like an external scout who just like scouts for foreign entities, but also scouts for Netflix. And then they have an internal team who kind of receives that intel from that scouting agency. And then they're like building like a three to five person team with assisted. It's like a very, very different business model. So the fact that there's two of us, we're the same level and we have no one above or below us is like pretty much unheard of. And it's a very strange structure, but I think it totally works for us because I think it's like a lot of these places have a lot of fat and we kind of have no fat. It, it's interesting because it sounds like your job is to just read and pick stuff up that's very, and I'm sure there's more to it than that, but like, it, is that, do you read for like, do you read for pleasure anymore? Do you pretty much read everything? Like I, I'm, I'm reading I read this Batman the comics of for pleasure because at the end of the day, <laughs> I, the last thing I want to do is open my iPad and read a book. It sucks. And this brain has like completely fried my brain. Uh, I'm making it sound bad. So obviously there's a lot of benefits and it's super fun. And I get to work in a movie studio, which is what I always wanted to do ever since I was a little kid, but I cannot read for pleasure anymore. I mean, maybe I will in the future. It's also just like, even when I'm on vacation, like you, you know, we shut down for two weeks or whatever in December and I'm like, usually on vacation somewhere. I like, I'm like, Oh, I'm going to read the stand by Stephen King or like some big ambitious thing. That's obviously already spoken for. Or it's already been adapted or it's just not really a book I would ever read for work. And then my brain reads in a different way than I think most people's do, because now I'm just think I'm like viewing chunks of, I'm like, oh, this scene takes place in the woods. This scene takes place in a room. Oh, there's a bomb being dropped in that scene. That's really cool. That's a big spectacle. It's, it's messed up. It's not ideal. I, w- I wonder if you can speak to like, you know, we, we we're talking about generalities of what makes st- certain stories stand out, but is there a particular story that you've adapted that we could do like a case study of? It's tricky. Yes. The short answer is yes. But uh, it's so frustrating because the book that I was talking about before that comes out in March is like my baby. I'm so excited about it. I wish I could tell you guys absolutely every single thing that's going on with it because it's super fucking cool. Uh, And that's like the one nearest and dearest to my heart. It's not out yet. So I doubt many, if any of you guys have read it. Uh, But just to briefly talk about it, I'm someone that loves like genre stuff and kind of like sort of tonally wacky stuff and like big spectacle that's why in many ways I'm kind of like an ideal fit for my sort of main job, which is like the Warner Brothers stuff, which is like the biggest of the big kind of stories. Um, but this book that's coming out in March is called Mickey seven. Uh, it's by a guy named Edward Ashton, but it's like a super fun. Pre- and it's also like my favorite thing is like the kind of premise where you hear it and you're like, that's movie. Like what if I, I'd like to think that if I was doing my job at the time, I would have heard the premise for the Martian and been like, I don't even care if this book sucks. I don't care if it sells 12 <laughs> copies. Like, guy's trapped on Mars and has to get back to earth by himself. Uh, are you kidding me? This is like a movie star role. This is a movie. This is so, f- it's like, that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking, and I'm also kind of a schmuck when it comes to plot. So like something that's easily followable, like 890 page, like dense fantasy epics. Uh, I'm just not the right person. For, like there's plenty of people who do my job who are really sort of proficient with that kind of book. And I look at that and I'm like, too stupid. Sorry, can't. Uh, but that book, Mickey Seven is great. So what it does, it, it takes place in like, a hundred years from now, let's say, you know, uh, people have like mostly left earth and a lot of people are on these sort of like big generation kind of spaceships. And then this one schmuck on earth named Mickey gets kind of the last job that he can on like a spaceship, which is like, he's the equivalent of like a crash test dummy where it's like, if they need someone to like go on the hull and like check the radiation and then probably get zapped and die, he does it because they have like a sort of 3d printer where they can print out another Mickey. So he keeps doing these like incredibly dangerous jobs and getting killed. And then he's like, they're up to Mickey six at the, or they're up to Mickey seven at this point. Cause he's the seventh Mickey he keeps dying. They keep printing on a new Mickey. Um, and then, you know, he's on like the book opens with this sort of big fun action adventure sequence where, you know, he's in like a near death experience with some aliens and then his partner on the ship, like thinks he died. So he prints out Mickey seven or Mickey eight. And then the original Mickey is not actually not the original, the seventh Mickey is not actually dead. So then you have Mickey seven and Mickey eight coexisting on a spaceship with limited resources. And there's, you know what I mean? Like that's, it's like a pretty easy, fun log line. You kind of get what the tone is. It's like this very kind of wacky, funny side, like funny action sci-fi. If you can sort of nail all three of those, like I'm Mm -hmm. so in the bag, like that is my ideal. Um, So that's one that I like was super excited about. And I think if that actually happens, the way that it's lining up to happen right now is going to be, Super cool. But another one that I actually talk about, which is completely different tonally from that, 
Um, there was an Elizabeth Gilbert book from a few years ago called City of Girls that ended up being a big bestseller, which is great. But part of the reason that I responded to that, so that's the lady that wrote Eat, Pray, Love, and she's like a big bestselling author. But that book is super fun. And I kind of like, the reason I mentioned it, and you know, I think a lot of people in my position might not have, because it's like set in the 40s, so it's period, which means expensive. It's very girly and pink feather boa, kind of like, it's also very like theatery, like let's put on a show. But it just kind of has this like Mrs. Maisel, Baz Luhrmann kind of like vibe. And I was like, this just feels like something big and splashy. They turned it into a musical in the draft that they wrote for us. Um, but it just felt very theatrical and very sort of like, back when I was making movies exclusively for movie theaters, like this was something that felt like big and something that your parents go see with you when you're home in like Thanksgiving or Christmas or something. You know what I mean? Like that's just kind of the, I'm, it's always this very sort of gut feeling where it's very hard to pin down exactly why I'm responding to it. But that was one where I was just like, there's something about this. It's just fun and fresh and splashy, even though it's period, but you got these elaborate costumes and big sets and blah, blah, blah. So you mentioned Mickey Sem. You said the book isn't out yet. It comes out in March. I don't know when it comes out. I've read the book a million years ago. So it's crazy. I read things so far in advance that my brain is, hold on, I'll tell you exactly when it comes out. The book comes out February, March. Let's see, hold on. February, February 15th by Edward Ashton. And it's already, so your involvement of this is that it's already becoming a movie project before it's published as it a book? It certainly seems like it. Like the director just turned in, the writer director just turned in his script. And last week he was meeting with three gigantic movie stars. Is that normal for a, for a movie deal to be in place no, before? No, it's not, no. Uh, in terms of like a movie be like the movie being so far down the road before the book comes out is definitely uncommon. But these days, part of the reason people like me are valuable is because so much stuff is optioned before it comes out because you have all these sort of like deep pocketed buyers like Apple and Netflix. Uh, people just have infinity dollars where if they want something and there's someone telling them, hey, this book is really good and it's going to be big, they just say, let's buy it right now. So it's very tough for places like us who are not, you know, I mean, I, it sounds ridiculous because I work for a gigantic company with so many resources, but we're not Apple and Netflix who just have trillions of dollars in cash and a content budget that's like really sort of aggressive and ambitious. Mm. And you mentioned that, you know, the team at Warner Brothers that does the adaptation process is not very big. So I'm curious because, you know, we I see that I was thinking the other day I was watching Sweet Tooth on Netflix and the Warner Brothers thing came up. Like, did you have a part to play in that? No, that was one where I'm trying to remember what the exact sequence of events was. That was maybe even something I'm trying to remember. I don't know. I wasn't involved in that. That was something where either they got it as a package where it was like they have a writer producer who signed to a first look deal named Joe Schmo. And Joe Schmo was like, hey, I found this comic I'd really like. Because that's a lot of how the TV studio Warner Brothers TV does it, where it's like they have writer producers who are signed to Warner Brothers TV. And that person has submitted stuff. Or like that person finds stuff and WBTV says, okay, we'll buy it for you to make it. So it was like, mm. I don't remember who the creator, executive producer, whatever is of that show, but it was probably someone who had a first look deal with Warner Brothers TV and Warner Brothers TV was like, okay, we'll pay for this for you. Like we'll pay for the option and you'll develop gotcha. it for us. So going back to, you know, Mickey seven and then the, the one you mentioned with the, 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 the other one, the, the feathery pink stuff. Yeah. City of Girls. <laughs> yeah, City of Girls. Seeing that they're so different. I'm curious at what point in, in reading these projects, does it, do you get that feeling like this is it? Is it, is it a, a sudden thing or do you have to read all the way through and then consider it for a bit? Um, it's okay. So it's, it's usually, it's funny. It's also, it so depends on like the particular seating that I'm like reading it in. Like if I sit down excited to like a book where I'm like, Oh, this premise sounds really cool. The way it was pitched to me sounds cool. I'm excited. I hope I like it. I think I'm going to. And then I start reading and I'm like, oh shit, this is really cool. I'm really into this. I'm really excited. And then I have to like go cook dinner and then I read dinner and then I sit down again after dinner to read it. I'm like, why is this not doing it for me? <laughs> All that to say, it's like so dependent on just like the vibe. But usually, I mean, I can tell if I don't like something within about five milliseconds, let alone like, you know, and I'll usually give it like 20 pages if it's like hot and buzzy. Uh, but at this point, like there's so much stuff that gets like buzz and I'm just like, this is written like a fourth grader wrote it. And it's so <laughs> irritating. The tone is like, pissing me off. I can't deal with this anymore. I'll just like throw it away. Cause I'm like, I, life is too short. And I have too many other books to read. Um, it's, you know, and it very often is the case that I'll like finish a book. And then let's say this is a book that doesn't come out for a year. It's a book that like, you know, is kind of maybe being released soon, but isn't coming out yet. And then, you know, usually when the book comes out and there's like reviews in the New York times or whatever, the LA people will finally start to be made aware of the book. Then and they'll be like, Hey, what's the deal with this book that I saw in the New York times at the LA times that got a really good review. I'm like, you know, it's funny. I read that book eight months ago and I haven't been able to get it out of my head. I really like it. And that's 
that happens a lot where like we'll kind of read stuff initially, have thoughts on it. Maybe we've even pitched it and then they pass or it's too early or whatever happens and no one says they want to take a look. Um, and then when the book comes out or as it's getting closer to publication, we get sort of incoming messages about it. Um, and then, you know, sometimes you're like, yeah, you know, I thought about it and I decided that that book sucks. Or sometimes you're like, oh, I've thought about it. And, you know, I really like that book. I think it's like really cool and it has a really interesting premise or tone or whatever. Uh, so it really depends. Sometimes you can tell right away. Sometimes you can't even tell until a year after you read it. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I'm curious what the, the, you know, you mentioned how long it takes for these projects usually to hit the screen to, to become, you know, seen by everybody. Does the, you know, the, the social political climate play into that? Because like, there's trends, there's so many trends. And if you're acquiring something and it doesn't get made for three years, I mean, to take Sweet Tooth, for an example, I love the show. But when it came out, it was right in the middle of a pandemic and it's set in a pandemic. And at the mm -hmm. time I was like. Oh, well, that's a bummer. But I mean, it's still a great show, but I'm curious how much that plays into the production of it. It does. It's like, it's funny. I feel like in 2017 and 2018, there was like all this stuff that was probably directly in response to like what was going on with the federal government. Like there was a lot of like, quote unquote, like resistance stuff or very sort of like, you know, I think that's when The Handmaid's Tale really took off. Like there was all this stuff that felt very informed by this kind of national anxiety that was going on. And so you saw a lot of stuff that was sort of willing to delve into this darkness that I think a lot of people thought everyone was feeling. Um, and then it's really interesting because starting like a year and a half ago, all of a sudden everyone's like, we just want Ted Lasso and Schitt's Creek and we're not interested <laughs> in really anything that does not have that tone. So it's like, I would be a total nincompoop if I were to recommend anything set in a dystopia at this point. Like it's such a non-starter and like my bosses are convinced whether they're right or wrong that like, audiences do not under any circumstances want to say anything that's bleak and dark and heavy. They're just not interested. So like that was one of the reasons that like city of girls felt like a respite, like it was bright and funny and sunny and light and, you know, easily digestible. Um, so now it's kind of like a tricky thing because it's like, okay, are we literally just going to only scout for like super cheery, positive stuff for the rest of the time? That's like kind of really cutting out a large portion of the creative canon that's written in a given day. Um, so it's kind of a weird time and we'll see how things shake out, but yeah, it's definitely informed by like kind of the zeitgeist and the national sentiment and all that kind of stuff. And you mentioned how quickly or how easily a lot of these projects derail. Like if you acquire something, it's very oh possible God, that yes. it falls. What, I mean, obviously there are infinite number of reasons why it could, but what are some of the main reasons these fall apart before they reach production? Totally. Yeah. As, as I've seen it, at least at Warner brothers, the film studio, I mean, like, you have to realize like a movie studio is releasing in let's use 2019 because who the hell knows we're like rewriting the playbook every five minutes over here these days. In 2019 Warner Brothers was releasing between 15 and 18 movies theatrically per year. For a movie to actually get released like there's a lot of sort of bars that have to met be met. So what would very often happen is like I would option a book there was internal excitement and they were like super stoked on the book and they're like okay we're going to hire this writer to adapt it. And then what would often happen is the first draft would come in they would be like, all right, you know, it's fine. It's like, you know, maybe we have another step with them in their contract. So we have, you know, a revision with this original writer. They'll maybe commission a second draft. The second draft will come in and be like, yeah, you know, it's it's okay. And then they'll usually either let that writer go, they'll let the project go, because they're like, yeah, we don't see a path forward. And that's usually what happens, where it's like the, the, the sort of first draft gets made and it doesn't really generate the sort of internal excitement that you need. Because it's, a, like I said, it's a lot of work and you it's like pushing a boulder up a hill. So you really have to get... The exec who bought it excited. You have to get the president of production excited. You have to get marketing super duper excited because they have to like sign off and they have to actually sell this thing. You have to get the chairman of the studio excited. You have to get all these sort of various people on board. So the fact that anything ever becomes a movie ever is like <laughs> astonishing to me. And is that your job to get all these people excited or, or is that just? No, my job basically stops when I find the one like, so I work with, the creative development team who are the LA guys who like, you know, the reason we exist is because they know how to do their job when it comes to like being submitted scripts from agents and managers and like the normal sort of course of how movies get made. You know what I mean? Like you get a script or you have a property that the studio has the rights to and they hire a writer to like do a take on it or something like that. But what they don't know anything about is they don't know anything about publishing or comic books or sort of anything that falls outside of that normal trajectory. So that's why we exist. So, you know, when I'm advocating for a book, it's not enough for me to be like, I love this book. I'm going to buy it 
for Warner Brothers and I'm going to shepherd this project through. No, it's like, no, I can't realistically do that. I need someone in LA to sign off on it. And I need someone who's going to be like, yeah, I'm going to, this is going to be my project. Um, so usually my job, except for like, you know, the execs who are nice enough to sort of keep me in the loop in terms of, like I said, the drafts and the writers and the creative discussions that go on, obviously, after you initially acquire something, uh, they're the ones who are doing the day-to-day logistics in terms of actually getting this movie made. And how much of the acquisition process for you is personal taste versus knowing the market? Like, could you read a book and be like, I'm not really into this, but I can see how other people would be? Great question. Um, yes. And it's so, I've been sort of bitten in the ass so many times by that, where it's like, I'm reading something, I'm like, this is straight up garbage. And I like, can't bear my soul to like continue reading it. And then like, it sells to like a big splashy deal. And then I'm like, yeah, but I did read it in one sitting and like, maybe that means something. You know what I mean? Like that happens all the time where I'm like, this is trash, but it's like compulsively readable trash. Uh, <laughs> I'd like to think I've gotten better at that as time's gone on, but it's like something I deal with all the time. There was a book that a few weeks ago went around, which is like a super hooky premise. It's called Sylvia 2.0. It's about this like woman in Boca who's like a retiree. She has her husband. She has her nice like old person life over there. And then she walks in on her husband of like 70 years cheating on her with like his tennis partner or whatever. So she's like, I'm going to go to New York and like make a go of it. And she's like a 75 year old woman who like brings her buddy. And you know what I mean? It's like fun. You can imagine what the book would be. You can imagine what the series would be. You can imagine what the movie would be. But I just started and I was like, oh my God, this writing is so dumb. And I like, you know, I ultimately think I was right because, you know, even if there's initial buzz on the film and TV side, like I think if the writing is that bad, maybe the book won't work. And I think maybe there's something to that sort of initial gut feeling where I'm like, this book is annoying me. Uh, I'd like to think I'm pretty good at sort of putting myself outside of like my own personal like tastes like this felt like okay the objectively like the writing is objectively bad in this as opposed to like hey maybe it's just not for me which happens a million times a day and I'm able to sort of like you know implant my brain into like a reader for whom the book is actually written Uh, this just felt like dribble but yeah that happens all the time and then do you have a say in whether something becomes movie or TV? Like, do you read a book and you think this one's better for TV versus for a movie? And what sort of separates totally. the two? Yeah, and it's it's just sort of, uh, it's funny. It's like, that's kind of what my entire job is in some ways. It's like, I read something and it's like, okay, now what? Like, is this, and it's tricky because these days there's so much more TV based on books that's coming out. Like everything's becoming a limited series or everything's becoming an ongoing series. And just because of this sort of weird thing that's going on with movie theaters right now, you're just, and even though streaming is heating up, like you're just seeing way fewer movies based on books than you are seeing series based on books. So it's like, okay, this has a lot of scope and it's pretty big in scale. So maybe it feels like it should be a movie, but does it have a better chance of getting made as like a sort of flagship expensive genre series at HBO Max? And I don't mean to just talk about big genre stuff. There's obviously a million different genres of books that I'm reading all day long. But like for those kinds of books, that's the one where I'm like, I don't really know. Whereas something like that mostly visually consists of like a bunch of people talking in rooms is kind of the best way to think about it. Like that's clearly something that's probably best suited for a series because it's probably way more character development centric and sort of slower burn in terms of plot. And that's kind of what I was talking about where I'm talking about like my brain being fried by this job. It's like, I'm literally just visually thinking, what does this scene look like when visually presented on a screen? And once you acquire something, is the author involved at all in the process of the production or is it kind of theirs gets acquired and they just sit back and watch it happen? It totally depends on the project, depends on the author. It depends on like whether that author is sort of bringing something valuable to the proceedings in terms of like, maybe the reason the book works so well, or maybe the reason the book is likely to break out and be a success is because of the platform or the personality or the whatever of the author. In that case, it's obviously super beneficial to keep the author involved. Whereas like, to be completely honest, that book, Mickey Seven, uh, I think the author was like pretty unknown. I think the filmmaker that is making it definitely like knows what the hell they're doing at this point. So it's like, I don't think he's super involved in the production. I don't, I don't think even if you asked him, I, don't, I think he'd be like, yeah, it's fine. Let the guy make it. He clearly is going to make a better version than anything I would be involved in. You know what I mean? But it totally depends. And sometimes, you know, a lot of novelists are getting really involved in screenwriting and TV writing now because it's also just way more lucrative, I think, than fiction. Uh, so that's like a very, very viable path for people these days is like write a great novel, get a little bit of buzz, maybe tell your author, uh, tell your agent if it's super competitive, like, yeah, uh, I'm willing to sell it to you, but the deal is that I'm attached to executive produce or adapt it myself. And then you kind of use that to sort of segue your way into like a legitimate writing career in LA. Mm -hmm. 
And I'm curious, it, it seems like a job where there, is there like a, a quota or a barometer that you have to uh, uh, like assess your job performance by, or is it kind of just nah. like, okay, that's great. <laughs> that's, that's a good answer. It's great. I mean, <laughs> that might be the case at other places, in which case that sucks for those guys. I think my boss is just like a chiller and she's just like, yeah, I mean, I'm like, I, I don't know. It's, I, it's cool. It's nice that that's not the case. Mm-hmm. I mean, look, if I literally was in my job for f- four plus years at this point and we had an option to single thing, I can't imagine that looks very good, but it's, that hasn't been the case. So I'm, you know. Gotcha. So I'm going to get into some audience questions now because they're starting to pile up. Cool. I want to make sure we get to as many as we can. So you, you touched on this a bit, but uh, describe the process. So you find a book you like and do what? Is there a group you pitch to? Do you compete with others that are trying to acquire it? Are you pitching against other projects? Like how does that process look for you? Sure. So it's different every time. There's like, think about it two ways. Let's say there's a competitive project versus a non-competitive project. Non-competitive is easy because it's like, let's say I read a book, either it's before there's buzz and there will be buzz, but I'm getting it to it early. Or that's just a book that for whatever reason people haven't read or people are not super competitive over. Then I just like talk to the exec who I want to send it to. I say, hey, I think this is a really cool book. They read it. They feel the same way. They're into it. They say, let's go make a deal. Let's try to option it. We talk to the agent, we make an offer. They inevitably say, hey, we want more money. They make a counter offer. We say, sure, you got it. Here's the money. They hand us the book. We now have the option. When we say optioning a book, it's basically we have the exclusive option to develop it ourselves and try to turn it into a movie. Um, That's like the easy version and it never actually works out like that these days because if something's good, everyone else is also gonna think it's good. So the competitive version is like, there's a book that goes out on submission from literary agents to editors. People like me start reading it all over town. They start telling their LA people, hey, there's this you know, really cool book. I think it's worth taking a look. Take, you know, Make sure you read it. And then all the sort of various streaming, studio, whatever entities start like being like, oh, we're super into this. This would be good for this filmmaker. This would be good for this producer. This would be good for this director. Um, and they start kind of like putting their offers together. And then you know, if it's a super big deal, there's gonna be like an 11 way auction between like various types of suitors like sometimes streaming networks cable networks uh broadcast networks big studios small like mid-budget movie studios indie movies sometimes like it's all just a you're kind of like if you're the author you're weighing the talent attachments you're weighing the budget you're weighing how involved or not involved do they want you to be so it's kind of like up to them what they're trying to get out of it like one time there was this really hot book that's actually going to be a martin scorsese movie that's coming out next year called killers the flower moon based on a david grand book and there were all sorts of like crazy offers coming in for this book and he ultimately went with this company called imperative that was like super flush with cash but like pretty untested in terms of their actual finished products and everyone was like super surprised by that and he's like yeah i got a kid with special needs i just wanted to check mm-hmm. so he just literally went with like the absolute biggest check And, you know, the movie's coming out and it's going to be Martin Scorsese movie with Leonardo DiCaprio. So, like, clearly everything works out the way it's supposed to be. Uh, But, yeah, at the time, he just took a $2 million check and, like, ignored, like, George Clooney's attached and Ben Affleck's attached and all these sort of, like, big things that it's easier to imagine the sort of finished movie. Mm -hmm. Next question. Some great movies started as short stories. Do you ever dig into short stories or is it mostly novels? These are such good questions. Every single question you've asked and the audience has asked today, great questions. So it's funny, I feel like my job, they go through like a phase every little while where they're like obsessed with short stories because the truth is everyone in LA is, not everybody, they're all pretty stupid and they're not great (laughs) readers and they're, I'm rounding up to illiterate. So they, you know, I say, oh, I got this great book uh, and I'm like, you want to take a look? And they're like, oh, it's 350 pages, cool. And, you know, they're reading scripts and they're doing other stuff, so I don't blame them. But it's like you tell them, oh, I got a buzzy 31-page short story. They're like, this is more my speed. Give me more of this kind of stuff, you know. Uh, So there was like this crazy fervor, I think, like two years ago at this point, where just everyone was losing their marbles about short stories. Where like these things were going – it's like you're reading a five-page short story that like Jordan Peele optioned for like $5 million. And you're like, just tell someone to go write a script based on this cool idea that you had. It's the exact same thing in terms of like the value that you're getting from the source material. Um, So yes, I read them. I'm a little bit cynical when it comes to like 
the super monetary value of a short story because like I said, if it's good and it's like, you know, very often these short stories are like the first act of a screenplay in prose form. And it's like, okay, yeah, I can see why this is valuable for a place to have, let's say your media, you're taking a general meeting with a writer. You just say, oh, this is a short story that we sort of have the rights to. We have it in our sort of stockpile of material that we control. So I get the utility of it, but it's, I think sometimes in LA, it's just like, there's like these dopey agents who are just trying to create bidding wars over like 10 page short stories where it's like, this is, I don't know that this is worth $750,000. I gotta be honest, you know? <laughs> Next question. Uh, what project are you proudest of at this point? Uh, I think it's definitely the one that doesn't exist yet, which is kind of a drag. And if it never happens, I might have to throw myself off a building, but uh, <laughs> that's really cool. And also I'm trying to think. You know, there's another one that I optioned when I was at Sony that I think it's it's been so long. It's a book called Dark Matter by Blake Crouch that like had various iterations of almost being a movie and then not being a movie. Um, and the last I heard, I don't know how accurate this is, but the last I heard it was actually going to be an Apple TV show, but it's like such a fun premise. It's basically, it's the same kind of thing as like The Martian or whatever, where it's like such a great little one line summary. It's like a guy gets kidnapped of a version by, guy gets kidnapped by a version of himself from an alternate dimension. Easy. You can imagine all the fun sort of visual and storytelling possibilities. Um, but that one, that's one that's been like kicking around for seven years at this point. It seems like it's actually happening now at Apple TV, but we'll see. Next question. Every book agent and editor has a, oh, I should have never have passed on that moment after seeing mm -hmm. a huge success. Do you have any similar moments? Not really, but the closest that I can come up with, you know, I was mentioning earlier, occasionally I'll read something and I'll be like, oh, this is like not very good. And then I'll kind of pass on it and then be like, well, but it, you know, was super compulsively readable. And that's usually a pretty decent barometer for like something being a bestseller. Um, there was one book that I passed on that I really was like, this is, so, you know, I started doing this job in the, in the sort of wake of Gone Girl and Girl on the Train and all that kind of stuff. And everyone's like these big sort of sexy female thrillers. And there was this one that came down the pike and I was like, this is so derivative. It feels like a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy of, I'm like I can't in good conscience actually recommend this. And it's funny because of all of the books in that era that got optioned, some of which were optioned by me, it's the only one that actually became a movie. And it was that book, uh, A Simple Favor, which ended up being an Anna Kendrick, Blake Lively movie. And I, do I regret passing on it? Not necessarily. I think the movie actually tonally was like a little more fun and adventurous than the book was. The book was pretty C plus. Uh, and the movie had like a lot of fun, dark humor and kind of delicious nastiness to it, which I thought was cool. Uh, but yeah, that that's one where I passed and then Fox bought it. And my boss is like, what happened here? And I'm like, uh, I don't know if I would pass if I had to do it again, but I have to stick by my guns and I passed. Mm -hmm. So then the flip side to that, another question, any examples of things you were convinced were going to be huge that ended up being flops? <laughs> oh, God. Uh most books don't work and that's the truth and it's like kind of we try to convey that to la people all the time because i think it's different for them because let's say you work at warner brothers and you work at a big studio movie studio uh and you're releasing 18 movies a year theatrically it's like they kind of understand that some movies don't work but like every now and then you have like the movies that make up that pay for the rest of the slate. Like you have a movie that comes out like Joker or whatever that makes like so much more money based on its budget. Or you have a movie like, you know, I don't know, I'm trying to think of any, like Aquaman, it's terrible. All these are DC movies and they pay for the rest of the slate. But it's like, there's so there's such a big volume of books that are released every single day and like 98% of them don't work as opposed to like 30% of them or 40% of them, which is I think what it is in movies. You know what I mean? Like so few, and especially now I think especially for like the quote unquote big books, I think what they think of as like big sci-fi or genre books, a lot of that audience is primarily migrated to like video games or like sort of different platforms and they're not necessarily reading sci-fi books in like super large numbers anymore. So a book like Ready Player One, it's like who knows if something like that would be possible in 2021, you know? Mm -hmm. Next question. Your path to this job sounds like it was a little atypical. What kind of qualities experience is attractive to studios looking for story editors? Story Do you mean story editor? Story editor is a different job. I would say speak to your position. Yeah, okay. Um, you know what I think is valuable to the people in LA is because I sort of started off as like a film guy, like I sort of immersed myself in the vernacular of 
stu film studios and the movie business. The fact that I sort of subsequently went and like became a quote unquote expert in publishing and was able to relay that information in their lingo and like speak their language, but just sort of translate it into movie terms and just like, I think hang with them for lack of a better word, as opposed to like being a publishing nerd who had no idea how a movie got made or any sort of realistic expectations is like, you know, if I worked for Warner Brothers and I brought them like book after book set in like an Irish seaside town in 1794, they would be like, why the hell do you work here? Like you clearly have no idea what kind of movies we make. But I think because I have an awareness of just like having immersed myself in the industry and the, the sort of even just like the news that's popping every single day, like there's people announcing projects or people being attached to projects where it's like, oh my God, that guy's starring in this project or that director is taking on this property, blah, blah, blah. So just like knowing that kind of stuff and like, at the end of the day, that's my like ride or die. Like I'm a film and TV guy. I start off as like the biggest movie HBO kid you could imagine. And the fact that I sort of subsequently became like, a, I'm like, you know, I think to publishing people, I'm a publishing guy and to movie people, I'm a movie guy who happens to know about publishing and kind of like tell them these little secrets on the side. And I think if there's value that I offer, that's kind of what it is. Gotcha. Next question. Do your reading choices shift with Hollywood's shifts as to what is popular? Yeah, like I said, like these days, I'm probably not going to be super eager to reach for something that's like relentlessly bleak and dark just because like I've been told again and again and again at this point for over a year that it's like that kind of stuff is maybe a non-starter, you know? Next question. As a developmental editor, is there common advice you offer authors? It's not so much common advice, but what I think is really interesting about being an author versus being, let's say, an aspiring screenwriter is if you're an aspiring screenwriter, there's not really a sort of like time tested or like proven trajectory in the sense that like you can have written like two amazing screenplays, but you happen to live in Wichita. If you don't have that access to like people who are going to send it around for you or like whatever, it's very difficult to explain how you go from guy with two PDFs on his desktop to like guy who sold his spec script for a million dollars versus if you are a novelist and you've written two like amazing, beautiful novels, there exists this thing called the slush pile, which is like, you know, the odds are not necessarily in your favor, but there is a million, like there are a million authors throughout history who have just sort of like blindly submitted their book to an agent who was open to submissions that in turn or whoever read that book and was like, hey, this is actually amazing. And then passed it on to their boss who was like, oh my God, I can't put this down. I have to sign this person. Like that happens all the time. That happens every single day. That doesn't necessarily happen in film and TV. Like it's definitely a little more circuitous in terms of like getting to that place. But like fiction, there is indeed a trajectory. So it's like all the, I talk to authors all the time who are like, how can I get into like film and TV writing? And like, how can I, so, you know, it's not necessarily working for me as a novelist. How can I segue into TV and film? I'm like, you're actually way more well situated being a novelist who just has a good book to their name than whatever sort of like backdoor weird shady stuff you're going to try to do to like finagle your way into film and TV. And it's probably not going to work anyway. You know? I'm getting a lot of questions about how you find the books because you don't take pitches from agents. How do you find these I'm books? Okay. So like a lot. Okay. For example, on Friday afternoons, I send a memo to every, to all the like creative execs in LA and that is sort of filled with some books that I know agencies are going on submission with. Um, uh, you know, they send out a big list or whatever, and they're like, we're on submission with this book, this book, this book. So that's there, but that's not the stuff that I'm most excited about, because usually that's the stuff that's like pretty late in the game. Either the book just came out, or it's coming out imminently, or everyone kind of has a take on it. Everyone has a read on it. The books that I'm valuable for having brought in, and the reason I think I'm an asset is because I'm getting stuff super duper duper early. I'm getting stuff sometimes like where I'm like the third person who's read it in the world, because basically the author sends it to their literary agent, the literary agent sends it to a bunch of editors and the editor I'm friends with forwards it to me. And I'm reading the book before the editors even get around to it. So I'm mostly getting stuff that is on submission to publishers before it's even acquired. And that's, that's not to say that's necessarily a hundred percent of the books that I'm getting and reading in a given week, but it's definitely like most of, my sort of excitement is like, I just got this hot book. Who the hell knows if it's any good? Who knows if it's going to sell? Who knows if it's going to be buzzy or whatever? But it's like, it could be because it's just hot and fresh and no one knows yet. So let me read and sort of evaluate myself. So authors don't send you books. It always comes from 
Authors zero percent of the time sending books. Okay. Next question. What is the appetite for stories featuring black protagonists? What kinds of stories you work? Humongous. I think I'd like to think it's not like a purely cynical kind of thing, but obviously after summer 2020, there was a lot of like, you know, putting on a show, however sincere that was at like the studio and Warner Media as a whole and entertainment conglomerates as a whole of just like, we need to be more inclusive. We need to have sort of more diverse faces. Um, and I think they've mostly put their money where their mouth is. I think they've, you know, like we've signed way more black writers to overall deals. And we have like a really sort of super diverse creative team at Warner Brothers feature team. You know what I mean? Like there's, there's a lot of ways they are kind of like walking the walk. Um, and there's also a lot of like latent, like sort of disbelief in those kinds of projects for, like, for example, we have a movie coming out on Friday called King Richard, which is about Venus and Serena Williams' dad. It stars Will Smith. So, like, you know, it helps to have a gigantic global movie star. But that's a project where I think without Will Smith, you'd have a lot of the sort of more jaded execs being like, I don't know. Like, you know, there's this sort of adage in Hollywood, which is pretty racist or whatever. Where it's like, oh, black movies don't travel, meaning they don't perform well internationally. And there's all these kind of, like, sort of remnant kind of, like, internalized racism me things involved in the way that Hollywood makes movies. So yes, even though they are making a more diverse slate of movies now in 2021 than they ever have before, which is I think objectively true, there's still a lot of work to be done. Uh, and there's, you know, definitely ways even I, who is not necessarily in a position to think of the most creative, you know, least obvious solutions can think of just sitting here at this desk. So definitely there's a lot more stuff to be done. So many good questions here. We're not going to get to all of them, but I'm going to try to fit two more in here. So when you're reading a novel, are you thinking about whether it hits screenplay structure elements like plot points, midpoint, et cetera, or do you think that can all be worked out in the adaptation? Can you ask that one more time? I just want to make sure I'm understanding the way you're describing it. Sure. When you're reading a novel, are you thinking about whether it hits screenplay structural elements like plot points, midpoint, et cetera, or do you think that stuff can be worked out in the adaptation process? Good question. Um, it depends. I mean, you want like a little bit of that. If a book is like told entirely via like, you know, someone's omniscient third person narration or someone's sort of internal thought process where it's like Finnegan's Wake, where it's like entirely stream of consciousness, that's something where I read that and probably be like, hey, maybe this is not the most suitable thing for, uh, you know, an adaptation. Uh, but, you know, you always want like some element that makes it filmic in some way, either a super compelling character or a really interesting world we haven't seen before or maybe a really cool tone that it's easy to imagine kind of what that looks like and why that's fresh or, you know, big visual spectacle, blah, blah, blah. There's a million reasons why something feels appropriate for the format that it feels appropriate for. Um, it's kind of a, you know, pornography thing where it's like, I know it when I see it, uh, but it's, you know, it's different from project to project. I personally am someone that really responds to like, sort of structural, you know, something where it has a similarity to like the structure of a movie, just like screenplays, you know, it's kind of unfortunate that they all sort of have to cleave into this 120 page three act kind of structure. But I think there's a lot of value that comes from sort of trying to condense a story into that format. All right, one more question. How does an author protect their work? For example, if an author submits a piece of work that may not yet be published, how can the author be protected in a way that other readers in the development industry don't take the premise and develop their own story based on the author's original work? People are always talking to me about this and they're very concerned about it. I really sincerely in my heart do not believe that that is an issue that really anyone needs to worry about. Everyone, like my dad, for example, is like an aspiring songwriter. He's not very good. He's always just like, how do I copyright my songs? I'm like, I promise you no one is trying to steal your songs. Like, I know there's been a lot of lawsuits about like, oh, this person stole my thing. They stole the premise for, you know, my show. And then they went on to make whatever, you know, gazillion selling, whatever. There's not really like an official good way of protecting your work. And if you're one of these people who's like hoarding your ideas until some imaginary platonic point at which like you're going to have all the access to getting it in front of whoever needs to read it. But like you're hundred percent confident that they're not going to, I guess, steal it. That's never going to happen. So there's not really like, any great advice that I have for you. Like no one's gonna steal your stuff. Like just, you gotta shoot your shot. Like, you can't live just hiding in your house, hoping no one's gonna, you know, thief your intellectual property and like bilk you out of billions of dollars. 
I'll sneak one more question in here. What's your opinion on scripts based on true stories? Sounds great. A lot of great movies been based on true stories. Uh, I just started that Apple TV show, The Shrink Next Door with Will Ferrell and Paul Rudd. It's based on a super crazy short story. Uh, I think a lot of time, no, but that's not even necessarily true because we had a movie last year called Judas, or this year, called Judas and the Black Messiah that's like obviously based on Fred Hampton. It's a true story. It's, you know, I, I have a feel neither positively nor negatively. I've, you know, I optioned a book when I was at Sony called Blood in the Water, which is about the Attica prison uprising, which is super intense and visceral. It was way more visceral almost than any fictional story about a prison break could have been. And I think often, oftentimes when you have that real life element, it just makes it all the more exciting because you're like this actually fucking happened this is bananas uh so yeah i love that and then last but certainly not least if people want to work with you as a story editor sure. how how do they get in touch with you sure so i have this little uh google form here thing that i'm just going to put in the chat i don't have anything to i'm not going to like spam you because i don't have anything to send but if you're interested just like send me a little message on there and i'll get back to you and we can keep talking yeah. about it. And I'll include that link in the show notes too. So don't feel like you have to copy and save it. I'll, I'll send it out after the episode. Uh, Phil, thank you. So uh, before, uh, sorry, it, how can people, are you on social media or website or anything? How, anything you, nah, you want to promote? <laughs> I have anything I want to promote. Yeah, I do actually have something I want to promote, albeit uh, it's a little unconventional. I'm in a band. We just uh, released a music video on Wednesday. I kind of like it. So I'm going to put the link <laughs> for the music video. Is, uh, I think it's pretty cool. And my baby is in it. You can see her. She's cute. <laughs> I'm going to include the link. And I'll include that in the show it. notes too. All right. So everybody, everybody will get it. Cool. Get those awesome. YouTube views up for us. That's right. Phil, thank you so much for being here today. This was a great conversation. Sure. Thanks for having me. See you soon. <laughs> Yes. So to all of our listeners, uh, we'll be back next week. We're talking to Eric Smith. Uh, and thanks for being here. We'll see you next time. Bye.